end of April, I was asked to visit Melling, which is about 10 miles northwest of Lancaster, to try to locate the gravestone for someone looking for a particular person who they thought was buried in the parish church. It wasn't the first time I'd visited a church in a place called Melling, but it was the first time I'd visited that one. The other Melling, as you may know, is quite a bit further south, also in Lancashire, which is a bit confusing. It's near Skelmersdale and Magull, and that one is dedicated to St Thomas and the Holy Rood. But that's not the one that I'm going to talk about today. The church at the more northerly Melling is dedicated to St Wilfred, so it's fairly easy to tell them apart. And according to Ripon Cathedral's website, St Wilfred was born into an aristocratic family from the Kingdom of Northumbria in the year 634 AD. When he was 30, he was a key speaker in the Synod of Whitby, which was the time when Northumbria decided to adopt the Roman method of calculating the date of Easter rather than using the old Celtic one. I didn't know that. Don't we learn some strange things when we start to research things? I'd never visited St Wilfred's Church at the Northerly Melling before, so I thought while I was there it might be interesting to look out for any other stones that seem to tell stories that I might be able to research a bit further. And these are a few that I found. If you have seen any of my other videos, you have probably heard me talking about the Victoria County history of Lancaster informally. Or, if we are to give it its full title, A History of the County of Lancaster, which was published in the early 1900s. There are something like 8 or 11 volumes of that history, so it does depend what you're looking for. And it covers more or less every settlement in Lancashire. You can read it online free of charge and I will put a link to the section on Melling in the video description so you can explore it at your will. And among the interesting things I found out from that text is that Melling and its neighbourhood historically seems to have been quite traditional. The people of Melling in 1536-37, to 37, we are told, joined the Northern Rebellion, so that's the Pilgrimage of Grace. It then goes on to say that at the Reformation, some of the leaving families, as you might guess, remained faithful to Roman Catholicism, and in the Civil War, which is a century later, to Charles I. So they're very traditional, by the sound of it. A few centuries earlier, Melling's church was, in 1094, given to St Martin's Abbey at Sayes, I think that's how you pronounce it, by Count Roger of Poitou. There's a name I've heard before. But was afterwards resigned in exchange for Gressingham, a chapel of ease. That was four and a half centuries before the Reformation. So it's reasonable to suppose, I think, that like many pre-16th century churches in Britain, although it may be Anglican today, St Wilfrid's must have begun life as a Catholic church. Before the Reformation, nobody had really thought about creating any other kind. Go back and replay that footage by all means if you feel that you need to after I say this, but hopefully that video clip was long enough to give you an impression 
of just how steep the churchyard is. The ground rises very sharply as you walk from the church path and then upwards up a hill. And 109 years ago, the Victoria County history also mentioned this, saying that the church stands on the western slope of an elevated plateau, the top of which forms an ancient earthwork known as Castle Mount. Does that mean there was a castle there, I wonder? But, but perhaps another thing that, that you spotted was the little window that was facing my camera as I was walking towards the building. Now that little window is worth a second look. The Victoria County history is great for many things, but one thing it's particularly notable for is its wonderful descriptions of church architecture. It goes into great detail. Frequently you will even find floor plans of various churches, even showing where different wings were built in different centuries. They go into that level of detail. So perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that whoever wrote the section on Melling paid attention to that window. But why would they pay attention to that particular window. What's special about that one? Well, the answer is in the text. The oldest part of the structure is the west window of the South Isle, which is of 13th century date, so the 1200s, being a single pointed trefoiled light, five feet high, and one foot seven inches so 19 inches which is about 47 centimeters wide and just below the window i noticed a couple of gravestones commemorating various members of the tomlinson family there was one for william tomlinson and his wife lettuce there was another one next to it remembering their son John. That inscription tells us a surprising amount about William and Lettice. He dies in February 1756, age 75, which means that he was born in about 1681, so during the reign of Charles II. She, meanwhile, lived on until March of 1769 but she seems to have been 77, going by what I can make out from the stone, which means that she was born in about 1692. And we also learn from the stone that Lettice was the daughter of Edward Wilson of Natland. And parish registers for St Helen's Church at Overton do confirm this. Not only that, they tell us William Tomlinson, the bridegroom, was a gentleman. It was clear enough from the neighbouring stone that William and Lettice had at least one child, so I couldn't resist checking the baptism records just to see whether there were any others. And it turned out that John was the fifth of six siblings, which I think is a perfectly good excuse to create a family tree.
away in a fairly inconspicuous bit of the churchyard under the trees, I found a gravestone remembering a couple with a rather unusual surname. Mary, the wife of Christopher Scambler of Scale in Robindale. Mary died on the 5th of November 1828, aged 46. She was born about 1782 or thereabouts. I didn't have to look very far to find out that it was at St Wilfrid's Church on the 5th of December 1807 that Christopher Scambler had married Mary Howson. They only appear to have had one known son, William. He was christened in October of 1810, also at Melling. Christopher went on to survive Mary by 27 years. He lived long enough to be recorded on the censuses, although I can't find any hint that he ever remarried again after her death. He himself lived to be 78, and the following obituary was printed in the Westmoreland Gazette. And it's somehow reassuring, I think, to have read that his end was peace. The 1861 census reveals that John Rowlandson Marshall, aged 31, captain of the 7th Lancashire uh, Militia, JP and DL for the county of Lancaster, and his 19-year-old wife, Jane, near Bainbridge, did live at Ray House, which is at Ray with Bottom, with a housekeeper, a cook and two housemaids. So. They are very definitely middle to upper class, I think. And the Lancaster Guardian tells us that their wedding had taken place in London nearly eight months earlier. They were relatively newly wed. John and Jane went on to have five children, but of those five, only one seems to have survived infancy. And by 1871, John, Jane and their three-year-old daughter Edith were living at a house called Egremont in the parish of St Helens on, of all places, the Isle of Wight. So it may be that they'd gone away for the holidays. And John's occupation at this point is stated once again to be Magistrate, Deputy Lieutenant of Lancashire, Late Captain, so no longer Captain of the 7th Lancashire Militia, and also Landowner. This is a man of status. Ten years after that, John, Jane and Edith were staying at the Albion Hotel in Plymouth. He, at this time, John is still the Deputy Lieutenant of Lancashire, he's still a Justice of the Peace, and both positions were acknowledged in abbreviated form on his tombstone, which also recorded his address as Ray House. His death was registered in the district of Skipton, so North Yorkshire, which is possible depending on which direction you went in to register it from Melling, although Lancaster would be a more ob obvious choice. Sadly, however, I'm not convinced that John's daughter Edith would have been present at his death. 
She married a captain in the Hampshire Regiment and died a year after her father, aged only 25, in India. Her death is, and her marriage in fact, are both listed in the Overseas uh, Marriages and Deaths Indexes. Edith Jane was rather well travelled herself. On the 17th of September, 1881, the Lancaster Gazette reported a death. Melling. On the 8th instant, so the 8th of September, at the schoolhouse, Mr. William Preston, organist and choir leader, aged 43, after three days of most severe illness, in the midst of life, we are in death. Mr Preston was generally liked in the neighbourhood for his cheerful disposition and musical talents, and his death is much regretted. The funeral took place on Sunday and was numerously attended. Logic said that our musical schoolmaster should have been in Melling on census night, and so he was. William Preston had been born in, of all places, Long Preston, near Settle, in Yorkshire. In 1874, he married Louisa Elizabeth Patience Jago from London. She was seven years his junior. And by 1881, they had two children. The exotically named Consuela, aged five, she was at school, and baby Percy, whose occupation was listed on the census as infant. That's a thorough. I do love a diligent census enumerator, and that's when curiosity got the better of me. It wasn't unusual for a teacher to act as the census enumerator. As if anybody is going to be literate and good at record keeping, surely it's a teacher. I flicked back through the various pages of the census for Melling in 1881, and right at the beginning you usually get a cover sheet where the enumerator is asked to describe the extent of the district they're responsible for. They will often tell you which roads they have covered as well and who should have signed it. Our schoolmaster, William Preston. And what a good job he did that year. Now you can't really get a much grander name, I think, than something like Alexander Burrow of Ingleton Hall. I haven't made him up, he really did exist. He was born in about 1802, he died in 1861. By looking very, very carefully at his gravestone, I realised that he had been married to a much younger lady, at Margaret Robinson, roughly 28 years his junior, and their marriage was announced in the Lancaster Gazette on the 1st of March, 1856. But despite the grand name given to 
his property. I mean, Ingleton Hall sounds really grand, very illustrious. But in fact, Alexander is recorded on the census as a yeoman. He's someone who owns and cultivates land. He is not necessarily wealthy, although he might be. But sadly, he and Margaret were not married for very long. Three years later, her death was announced in the Kendall Mercury. As a family historian, when I encounter a situation like this, where a man in his late 50s has just buried his 29 year old wife, my first instinct is to wonder, had Alexander Burrow been married before he married Margaret Robinson? There seemed like a very good possibility that this was the case. Unfortunately, Alexander was definitely living at Ingleton Hall in 1851, where I found him with his first wife, Mary Ann Taylor. The couple had married at St Wilfrid's, again, so we've got another link to the church there, on the 3rd of July, 1833. And one of the witnesses, according to the parish register, was a Robert Burrow. Could he be related? Curiously, when Alexander died on the 1st of December 1861, the relatives who were mentioned in his obituary were his sister and brother-in-law. A search of the marriage registers for St Wilfrid's confirmed that on the 16th of August 1824, Thomas Webster, a druggist from Ingleton, so a chemist effectively, married Elizabeth Burrow, a spinster from Rayton. And once again, a Robert Burrow is one of the witnesses. This Robert has to be a relation. And it turns out Alexander was the son of Robert Burrow of Newbiggin and Elizabeth Guy of Bottom in the parish of Bentham. They had married at Bentham on the 2nd of July 1794. So I think there's a very good possibility that the Robert Burrow mentioned on these marriage records could in fact be the father of Alexander and Elizabeth respectively. Could also be a brother depending on how long the father lived but I'm, I'm, I feel I'm leaning towards the father for some reason. is probably coming across and I think I've said it before. What really interests me about family history isn't so much the names and the dates, it's more what people got up to, it's the stories that are connected to the names that I find. And on first glance the marriage registers for St Wilfrid's seem to suggest that John Tatton was the vicar of the parish between 1754 and 1842. Now maths has never been my strong point but even I refuse to believe that it was possible for the Reverend Tatham to be vicar for 88 years. Scientifically, biologically dubious that. The baptism registers had the answer. On the 13th of April 1763 John Tatham, vicar of Melling, and his wife Elizabeth had their baby son, John, baptised. An extra note revealed that the baby eventually succeeded his father 
and held the vicarage for 57 years. He died February 1851 at 88. So there were two Reverend Tathams, father and son. That explains it. In England and Wales, death certificates only began from the 1st of July 1837. That was when the law came in that said that you had to register births, marriages and deaths. So technically speaking, it is impossible to get a copy of a death certificate from before that date because the civil registration system had not been invented. But that doesn't mean that you can't find out how a person died before 1837. It just depends how much detail the parish clerk or the vicar of a particular parish decided to include in the burial registers. And in the time of the Reverend Tatham, some fascinating notes in those burial registers tell us a little bit extra about those who are resting in the churchyard. On the 2nd of November 1788, Catherine Colston, a child, and Jane Colston, a child of Hornby, buried in one coffin. Could they be sisters, perhaps? 17th of November, 1788. John Crumblum, age 91, of Chipping Parish. Fourth of February, 1790, Anne Remington of Melling. She was taken ill and died at Kendal. Sixteenth of January, 1791, William Wilson, aged 83, of Botton. I am told he was confined to his bed 20 years. The 6th of August, 1792. James Brown was drowned as he was bathing in Lane in a deep hole at the end of the Lurd's home, 4th of August. He was about 20. And all for the sake of going for a dip. From about 1802, there was also a trend for recording the occupation of the deceased. So again, that's quite useful. For instance, Mary Turner of Ray, who died at age 90 in December 1802, worked as a dyer, even at 90. But there was no old age pension then. You worked as long as you could. James Baines of Lancaster, he was 42 when he died in May 1803. He was a chaise driver, so he's a, a carriage driver. When Betty Nicholson of Hornby died, aged 28, in July of 1805, her father, William, was noted to be a carpenter. So we can also deduce from that that Betty was probably not married and was probably still living at home with her parents. And finally, John Jackson, who lived at Raiden when he died aged 40 in April 1811. He'd seen more of the world than you might expect. He had been a seaman in His Majesty's service. So while we're on that watery note, I think I'd like to end with the story of a man who intrigued me as soon as I saw his name in the parish register. This wasn't a gravestone, this was an extract from the burial register and I could not resist finding out more. Thomas Ayrton was 80 years old when he died and like Mary Turner before him, he worked well into what we would call old age today. Age 80, he was still the postmaster at Ray when he was buried on the 19th of November, 1857. So we're into Queen Victoria's reign now. He was drowned in Hindburn on his way to deliver the mail at Hornby Station. 
tragic and unusual event. Fortunately for our purposes, the incident surrounding Thomas's death was reported in the Lancaster Guardian. A postman drowned. Thomas Ayrton, 80 years of age, has for many years acted as carrier of the post bags on foot between Ray and Hornby. Must have been fit. On Monday evening, he left Ray at the usual time, having the bag strapped across his back and being perfectly sober at the time. As he did not make his appearance at Hornby, parties proceeded from thence to look for him, but nothing could be ascertained at Ray beyond what is stated above. It was surmised that possibly the old man had turned down Kiln Lane instead of taking the straight road to Hornby, and this surmise turned out correct for he was discovered about half past three on Tuesday morning. Half past three on a Tuesday morning in November. It must have been very, very dark then. Lying in the rivulet Hindburn, which crosses Kiln Lane in about three feet of water, the bank of the Hindburn being at that place somewhat precipitous. The mailbags and his money were also found upon him and there can be no doubt but that Ayrton's had mistaken his way and plunged into the water. An inquest was held on the body by Mr Holden Coroner on Tuesday last at Mrs Wharton's, the new inn, Ray, when the jury returned a verdict of found drowned, which the newspaper report would certainly seem to support. It must have caught the imagination because the story of Thomas's death was picked up by several other newspapers. Over the next few days it was printed in the Liverpool Albion, the Blackburn Standard, the Montrose Review, which is a Scottish newspaper, and the Staffordshire Advertiser. But perhaps the strangest thing of all about Thomas Ayrton is that technically he shouldn't even be listed in the mailing registers at all. The burial entry states very clearly that he wasn't buried at Melling. He was interred at Holy Trinity Church in Ray. He did come from Ray. That would be his parish church. So how and why he was named in the records for Melling is a complete puzzle. As ever, there are some stories from the graveyard that you simply cannot make sense of. But even so, I hope you enjoyed listening to them.